He has spoken on the topics of faith, family and freedom in Cuba, Belgium, Brazil, Congo, UK and all over the USA to crowds from 14 to 40,000. International Leadership Speaker, Trainer and Coach Author of Learn to Raw Leadership, Attitude Hack, Live a More Excellent Life, 5 Battle Strategies of a Victorious Warrior. 2021 President's Lifetime Achievement Award Recipient. Founding Partner of the John Maxwell Team. Toastmaster International Speech Competition Semi-Finalist. Founder of Tell It Like It Is TV, ThatGuyRocks.com and ThatGuySpeaks.com. Creator of Story Power TV, Transforming Grace TV, and Leading Leaders Podcast. Producer of four TV programs and podcasts for Liftable TV and World Trumpet Television as well as multiple social media channels. Please help me welcome J. Lauren Norris. I was watching another one of those very short videos from the Whatever podcast, and the guest uh, was sitting there wide-eyed and waiting for her question when the host said, So tell me, what is it you bring to the table? To which she replied, I'm not answering that question. I'm not going to tell you how many books I've read or how smart I am or what I've accomplished. It's none of your business. I wouldn't answer those questions on a date either. He said, okay, okay, that's fine. That's fine. I'm not trying to get too personal. Let me ask you this. What do you expect a guy to bring to the table? And immediately she had a list of integrity and authenticity and originality and the ability to make a living and and just went right through the list of the whole thing. And when she was done talking and took a breath, the girl next to her said... So what's the female equivalent of all of that? And why couldn't you answer that question in the first place? What I just told you is a story of an experience I had watching a video. Was it a metaphor? Was it an allegory? Was it an anecdote? Was it an illustration? Was it just for entertainment's sake? And you probably are still reeling with what are the definitions of all of those words? That's what we're going to talk about in this episode of Leading Leaders, the Story Power series. Stay tuned. Subscribe now for our extensive video library of leadership lessons promoting faith, family, and freedom. I'm Jay Lauren Norris with Leading Leaders Podcast. And I know you've heard those um, speakers, teachers, lecturers, webinar leaders, coaches. They have a fascinating story to tell, but it doesn't really necessarily do anything more than take up your time. And maybe it's entertaining. If you're lucky, it's entertaining. But there's nothing really of redeeming quality aside from an entertaining story, unless they have worked diligently to masterfully include in the story a point. But not just, not just a point, a parallel, a point and a parallel, maybe multiple points and multiple parallels. See, the, the challenge I find with a lot of people, whether speaking from the stage or in a virtual event or one-on-one, -on -one, they have these fascinating stories, but when they come to the conclusion of the story, it may be all of the details of the story. We've talked about where do you begin with the story. We've talked about details. We've talked about word choices and alignments and connection. We've been working on this for a few weeks now. If you haven't seen all those videos, you can go back to the Leading Leaders podcast on Spotify or Apple or, or any one of those sources and watch it. Uh, you can go back to Facebook or YouTube or Rumble and Twitter and find them under my profile. You'll find all of them archived. They're all available. They're all free. But if you haven't walked through the process of the story and the word choice and all that kind of stuff, then today might be a bit, little bit lost on you. Again, we're still talking about story and the application of story and, and how do you use a story in your communication, taking things to the next level of excellence and expertise. One of the first videos you'll find, though, is be original, be authentic, tell your story, not somebody else's story. In fact, if the only story you have is somebody else's story, then you're probably going to lose credibility right away. I'm not saying that there's no value in it. I just told you a story of something as, that I witnessed. I was a first-hand observer. I have my own opinions of how that whole conversation went down. I didn't even watch the whole podcast, just the short that they put out there on social media to promote the podcast. And I still have an opinion and a conclusion and some ideas about what happened in that scene. 
you do too. And those are valuable. They're valuable lessons to learn. They're valuable things to express. I was able to tell that story. The short was probably two minutes long, maybe three. I was able to tell that story in less than two minutes. That's a good way to hook people in to say, these are some ideas that I want to consider further. Well, that's the whole point of communication, to open up the lines of communication, to get people to think, I kind of like the way you think, or I don't like the way you think, and I want to challenge it. But as a communicator, as a speaker, teacher, trainer, coach, whatever it is that you do, as a leader, trying to get your team motivated to gain buy-in into the new projects that you're working on or the accomplishments, the goals that you're trying to achieve together, you need stories. But you can't just tell stories that are entertaining. As fun as that seems to be, it, it kind of runs its course really quickly. No, you, you need to have stories that are, well, they, they know where you're going. Have you ever watched a butterfly or a moth as they journey from one place to another? In fact, there used to be a, I believe it was Gallagher, the guy who smashed his watermelons. I believe it was Gallagher who used to say, you know how to tell when a moth has gas. It flies in a straight line. Because normally a moth kind of flies like this. It's random. It, you, you never know when it's going to turn and go another direction. But when it has gas, it flies in a straight line because it's propelled for a moment. How many people do you know who tell stories and the storyline itself seems like that journey of a moth? You have no idea where it's going. It's not the flight of the butterfly, the beautiful musical piece. No, it's, it's the journey of a moth. Their story has no beginning and it has no end. It just wanders around and loops back on itself and you don't know where it started and you have no idea when it's going to end. You just wish it was soon. Now, the contrary to that is to have practiced and developed a story enough that it sounds like you're just having a conversation because you're so well rehearsed in the story. You've memorized the bits and pieces of it. You, you know the phrases that you want to use given the audience in front of you. Now, that doesn't mean that the same story won't work in front of 10 different audiences. It might mean that you, you take one phrase and you, you swap that out because, well, in that audience, that phrase might be offensive. But in another audience, you need that kind of rrr in that story to really get their attention, to make sure they're still paying attention. Another thing you need to know in the beginning before you get to the climax of your story is that when you conclude, where will you be? When you take them on that journey rather than a moth's journey, where will you take your listener? Where will you take your audience, your customer, your client? What customer journey will that look like? What is, as Stephen Covey would call it, the end in mind? Where do you expect to be when you wrap things up? When you call them to action, when you get to that call to action, I want you to do this. Where will they be? Where will they be emotionally? Where will they be in their head? Where will they be physically? Still in their chairs, standing up, running around in circles, high-fiving other people, hugging other people? Where will they be? What will they be doing? What will they feel like? What will they be thinking? And if you understand that your story has the ability to provoke that behavior, that thought process, that emotional reaction, that memory recall, that future casting of things to come, in your story alone, you can accomplish all of those things in a matter of a couple of minutes. That if you then stack several stories together to lead to the same conclusion, and you did so intentionally, then you could drive people through a course of action to learn several things in a short period of time that can literally make a difference in their life. You could transform their life before they walk out of the room. But you might also just be planting some really deep-seated seeds that will stay with them for decades. They'll come back later and they'll remember. I mean, if I just said to you, the emperor has no clothes. Now you might think in your mind, which emperor are we talking about or which ruler are we talking about or what foreign leader or local leader, domestic leader are we talking about who has exposed themselves? There are dozens of them, sadly, but really what you're recalling is the fable. From elementary school, the emperor has no clothes, except the one little boy who saw it and everybody else was lying about it. It was that mass deception of the public. What was the point of that metaphor? 
What was the point of that being told to us when we were all in first, second, or third grade? Well, it was a political propaganda piece, believe it or not. But it is so deeply seated into the minds of <clears throat> young people, the average American can probably tell you what the whole story is, having not seen it or read it for decades. It was a well-crafted, well-planted, deep-seated seed of a story with a purpose. They knew exactly how people would recall that story. Some might call it the Mandela effect. You plant an idea, and then you taint that idea along the way, and it manipulates the behavior of people. Kind of like the Manchurian candidate, only on a different level. But see, leaders, parents do it all the time. In fact, there's a whole series of videos of a guy whose cat likes to knock things off the counter. And one of the most recent ones I've seen of this guy is his cat is pushing around the liquid paper and he's about to knock it off the counter. And the guy sees the cat pushing the liquid paper towards the edge of the counter and he grabs a stuffed cat and he pretends that the stuffed cat knocked something off the table and then he smacks the stuffed cat with a shoe a couple of times. And the real cat pushes the liquid paper back away from the edge of the counter. Why? Because the real cat understands consequences. The real cat knows if I knock that off of there, he's going to hit me with a shoe. He never said that. He just implied it. You catching on yet? See, the story that you've worked through, the beginning to the end, the climax to the conclusion, you, you have an idea where you want people to be, what you want them to think, to feel, how do you want them to act and respond when you get to the end of that story. And if you are telling a story and you haven't thought through that already, you are, in my opinion, in my own humble opinion, you're lazy. You're a lazy communicator. You're telling the story for your own benefit, for your own self-aggrandizement. Not for the benefit or transformation or help of your audience. Now, there are different ways that you can use a story. I, I pulled out my, what we call the intermediate dictionary. This one is specifically made for young people. In fact, it says right here in the front. I thought this was funny because I always wrestle with entomology and etymology, which one of those words means what, and it bugs me, but... It says right here, Merriam-Webster's Intermediate Dictionary, the summary, provides definitions, pronunciations, etymology. There we go. Now I know. Part of speech designation and other appropriate information intended for use by students in grades 6 to 8. So what I'm about to read to you is not super complicated. It's not something you can't comprehend. You ought to be able to get this pretty easily. Right here on page 21 is the definition of, you ready? An allegory. An allegory is a story in which the characters and events are symbols that stand for truths about human life. Let me read that again. An allegory is a story in which the characters and events are symbols that stand for truths about human life. If you've seen the movie Ants, or you've seen the movie Monsters, Inc., or you've seen the movie Finding Nemo. In all of those, there are very few humans in them, but the allegory is that each of those characters represent a different person or people in your life. The characters in each of those stories, they have a whole way of looking at the world. There's a, a movie called A Bug's Life, another one called, a, is it A Bee's Life? where the comedian Jerry Seinfeld is actually the bee. And all of the various illustrations and things that they teach in that movie, it's a whole animated movie. The whole full feature film is animated, like a kid's program. But some of the concepts that they teach about relationships, about expectations, about societal and cultural differences, they're pretty dramatic. And if you were to try to take those same subject matter and move them into a human relationship encounter, you'd have a movie along the lines of, I don't know, Suits or the Peaky Blinders. Because the characters, the good guys and the bad guys, the, the criminals and the misfits, they're all portrayed really, really well in that allegory. 
And when you tell a good story, you might create an allegory from a life experience that you've had, something you've been through to say, I'm not just recounting the story. I'm kind of laying this as a framework over everyone. The way I treated my wife early, early on is probably pretty indicative of the way a lot of men treat their wives. Well, that could be a loosely attached allegory. But if you were to move that into the area of animals or plants or other critters and parallel all the people in the story, you have a pretty good allegory. But sometimes you actually use other humans in an allegory and you walk through like the... Uh, Genius, where did it go? I walked off camera. I know you can still barely hear me. I was going to grab it. I think it's called The Seven Types of Genius, uh, written by Patrick Lencioni. Probably one of the best allegorical books I've read in a long, long time. It's a really, really good book. But the whole thing is an allegory about work environment and about how people treat each other and how people think and what their priorities are. It's a phenomenally well-written book. And it's only when you get about 80% through that you realize the whole story has been an allegory. The whole thing was an allegory. The characters were made up. Let me give you another one. Um, this one is all the way back here on page 495. It's called a metaphor. A metaphor is a figure of speech in which a word or phrase or meaning of one kind or object is used in place of another to suggest a similarity between them, as in... The ship plows the sea. Compare this to a simile, a metaphor, a figure of speech in which a word or phrase or meaning of one kind of object or idea is used in place of another to suggest a similarity between them. Now, here's where you've got to be really careful with metaphors. A metaphor implies a common relationship or common similarity. And very similar to word choices, where you might have a certain meaning of a word and somebody else means something entirely different by that word, or they think they've heard it differently. They, they think they know what it means, but they really don't. They haven't done any study on it. You might use a metaphor with an implication. The ship plows the sea. Well, what does that mean? Well, they mean it's actually turning over the sea so it can put seeds underneath and it's going to turn it and put it back because that's what a plow does, right? They run the big disks through the earth and they push all the dirt over to one side and then somebody comes alongside in that row and they plant the seeds and then somebody else comes back along with the, with the disk and they flip the dirt back over on top of the seeds and then they water it and that's how you harvest the field eventually, right? Well, the ship's not actually plowing the field in the same way. And, and it's not plowing like a snow plow does. But the ship plows the sea because it pushes through it. It parts the water with the shape of its nose. It, it does a very similar thing, but not for the same purpose. If you were to say instead that the car plowed through the traffic at the light, well, again, we're not trying to plant a seed but kind of pushing your way through, forcing your way through. That's very similar to plowing through the ice or plowing through the sea or plowing through the hard ground. That metaphor makes good sense. But if you were to say, she plows through relationships, what exactly does that mean? If you said he plows through relationships, you might have a different kind of impression that maybe he's a domestic abuser or maybe he's violent or maybe he's narcissistic, but she plows through relationships, has a whole different mental gap because that just doesn't seem like the norm. See where I'm going? See, all of a sudden your story, just in that single turn of phrase, that one metaphor embedded in your story, can completely derail everything. And if you're not cautious, when you develop your stories, when you choose the story that fits the audience, when you select which portion of the story you're going to tell and you figure out what it means to begin with the end, to begin in the middle of the action, you've got to begin with the end in mind as well. You've, you've got to pull all those things together to get from the climax, the begin in the middle of the action, to the conclusion. And along that journey, you've got to bring in the right characters. You've got to speak to the audience 
in such a way that they see themselves in the story. Remember, we talked about that way early on, too, that if your audience isn't in your story, then your audience will abandon your story. As soon as your story abandons your audience, your audience abandons your story. If you're telling a story about people that look nothing like the people in the audience, they have no common experiences, they've had no common relationships, they have no common background or understandings, then all of a sudden you're talking to somebody who isn't there and you're not talking to the people who are. All of these are factors. When you select your story, you begin in the middle of the action at the climax, you work toward the conclusion, meaning I have an idea where I want them to go. One metaphor, improperly used. We've heard words like uh, a basket of deplorables. Well, if you're shopping and you grab a basket that you think is full of fresh apples, and you get to the register and set it down and there's juice running out on the counter and you pick it up and realize the bottom half of that basket, those apples are good for nothing but throwing away. They're already rotten. What's the old phrase? One rotten apple spoils the bunch. If you've got 25 apples in a basket and five of them are rotten, it's only going to be hours, days at most, before all the apples in that basket are rotten because... That's what rotten apples do. They spread. Well, let's see. What does the word deplorable mean? I haven't even looked that up. What is a basket of deplorables? Bear with me while I look up the word deplorable. D-E-D-O-D-I. Yes, I'm working backwards. Sorry. Diagram. Deserve. That would be close to deplorable. Deposit. Let's go back one more page. Depreciate. Dependent. Deplore. Deplore. Depopulate. That's weird that those are so close together. Here we go. To deplore, deplore, deplored. To feel or express grief for, to regret strongly. To consider unfortunate or deserving of disapproval. Huh. Deplorable. Deserving to be deplored. Lamentable, very bad, wretched, a wretched deplorable condition. A rotten apple. It's a pretty good description for a rotten apple. A basket of deplorables. You know, those things you throw away because they're of no use whatsoever. You should feel sorry for them. It's wretched. It's nasty. It's gross. Get rid of it. And yet, in the political arena, there was an entire swath of people who, based on their mental acuity and their worldview were considered a basket of deplorables. A basket of rotten apples? They're going to spoil the rest of the bunch? Is that what was meant? A basket of those that we disagree with and so their ideas are not valid, we should get rid of them? We should discard them? That's a pretty powerful statement. But see, it's easy to repeat a phrase like that because it's been said, it's been heard, and you don't think anything about it, and you weave it into a story, and you realize... The people for whom that representation was made, uh, there was another one that you should probably look up. Try to find the phrase human weeds. Human weeds. Find out who said it. And then when you find out who said it, compare everything else that individual has said over the course of their social, political involvement in life. And what you might find is, well, nobody wants to be called human weeds, but The reference to human weeds was very specific to a culture and a group of people. True story. Now, that's probably not the kind of phrase that you would use in a story, but understand there are a lot of things that we use like that, where our word choice becomes a metaphor embedded in the story that we're telling. And even though we've started with the beginning with the, in the middle of the action, and we've started with a good, strong story, and we've drawn people in emotionally, suddenly a turn of phrase that doesn't look like the conclusion we're trying to take them toward. Social justice, anyone? Climate change, global temperature change, global warming, global freeze, the next ice age. One might think all of those words were completely different in meaning, and yet from a political and a social political standpoint, those words are interchangeable. They don't mean the same thing. They have completely different definitions. But for the purpose of political rhetoric, 
They are interchangeable. If you're not cautious, you'll catch on to phrases, embed them in your story because they sound popular, they sound common, they sound like, well, everybody uses that phrase. But if you have not done your homework as a communicator to know what's the origin of that phrase, why do people say it? Why do they use it? What do they mean by it? What do they mean by it is more important than what you mean by it. Because perception is everything. And in the ear of your listener, that journey may be derailed in an instant when you throw in a word or a phrase that doesn't draw them to the conclusion you want to take them to. You as a communicator are responsible for getting them on the journey that you want them to go on and taking them to the place that you want them to get to. Your ability to do that masterfully requires that you do your homework. In a certain class of people, 2A means everything. A three percenter means everything. In another group, those same two words could be grounds for incarceration. That is not an exaggeration. That's the truth of our current political climate. But if you are not aware enough of the words that you're using, the choices that you're making, the metaphors, the illustrations, the allegories that you deploy in your communication, you may have one intent for your audience and come to another conclusion along the way. You've got to be very consistent, very persistent, very professional in the way that you do your homework, do the research, look up the words, look up their meaning, look them up in the Urban Dictionary. Not doing so might make you a little sus. If you don't know that one, you should probably look it up. Because right now there are a bunch of 20-year-olds looking at you going, dude is really sus. Boomer is really sus. If you don't know that phrase, you should look it up. Because as a communicator, you might accidentally, accidentally stumble across using it, thinking that it's a clever, funny turn or phrase, and you've just disqualified yourself. Because you don't know what it means. Do your homework. Take the time, even if it's just a simple turn of phrase meant to be coy or cute in the middle of your story, then ask yourself, not just how do I feel when I say it, but what do I mean by it? And what does everybody else mean by it? How do they interpret it? If they use the phrase, how would they be meaning to use it? And then is that consistent with what I intend to accomplish? And if you can't put your finger on that answer, find another set of words, find another phrase, find another allegory, another metaphor. You don't want to plow through your audience in such a way as to hurt people. No, you want to connect with them, bring them to your side, gain the buy-in. From climax to conclusion, if you don't have an intentional path, it will look like a moth straight to the flame. I'm Jay Lauren Norris with Leading Leaders Podcast for Tell It Like It Is TV. Have a blessed day. Lauren is a master teacher on storytelling, and I learned so much. Um, I'm really going to have to sit down and go back through everything, and I think I might have to have some more coffees with Lauren, but uh, it was totally worth my time, and I really highly recommend it if you're looking to grow your ministry, grow your business, uh, grow your career. Uh, Lauren will serve you well.